uh, my phone just cut off. So I think that these were actually um, people who were connected to the Masonic Lodge in Arcata, this family that I call a sem semi-hip family. Um, that was a place called Kids Place. So I was writing a lot about... Um, you know, I was fascinated with... Um, The 60s. How could you possibly live next door to a submarine? How much I loved the Yellow Submarine movie. That was a, you know, made a huge impression on me as a child. The Sea of Holes impressed me. The very concept. Plus it looked like an optical illusion, but it was only an illusion going into those holes and coming out, and especially picking them up and moving them. The concept of space, moving it around, changing it, putting it in your pocket was so neat. The monster that sucked up everything, and then it sucked up itself. And so I was talking about all the times that I could remember seeing the Yellow Submarine. Of course, this was before we had YouTube and even and videos and things like that. So it was like you could catch it every once in a while on the television. And I remembered the first time I saw it. So this is, there's, some of my early memories are connected with the Beatles. And um, so maybe, you know, I need to sit and try to really recall the times where I've, um, I've noticed my, you know, Beatles in my memory and my childhood and all that kind of stuff connecting in ways, um, try to understand, um, what they were doing with the Beatles exactly, because there's a couple incidences that I can recall of me having these strange flashbacks and trying to understand them over the years. Um, and then this is my most impossible dream of meeting John Lennon. Oh, with my band, my groovy band, which is as popular as the Beatles. So I wanted to have a band, and I wanted to um, play a concert with uh, the Beatles. And I was into Gumby. So there's a lot of stuff on and on and on. I considered myself to be sort of... I write about things like ad addicted to Gumby, all this kind of stuff. Um, this was kind of a weird period in my life where I kind of had just gotten past being really freaked out about all kinds of drug use and then had become curious about drug use and was trying stuff like pot and um, sneaking. Uh, I was like 14. I snuck some alcohol and stuff like that. So I considered that to be very dangerous and um you know, I spoke about myself as if I was, like, some kind of dangerous drug user, but I really wasn't. I was fascinated by the 60s. And I actually think that was, you know, this whole 60s thing and the hippies and all that, I really think that was done on purpose. In fact, you know, even these anti-drug messages seem to be done almost as if they are, at times, at least in the 70s when I was growing up, these anti-drug messages a lot of times were presented in such a way to make you curious about drugs, and I do think that was on purpose, and I think we need to recognize that for what it was. There was a bigger agenda going on than keeping kids off of drugs, and it really wasn't about keeping kids off of drugs. It was more about control. So this next entry, I'm writing at um, 10.40 <laughs> in the morning, I'm assuming, uh, on September 23rd. I watched Twilight Zone. I loved all that 50s camp stuff. And then, um, um, it says Sunday. I don't know what day that is. It says here October 9th, so who knows. But this was, this was, the last entry was September 23rd. I was reading Catch-22, so I made this quote, I took this quote from Catch-22 that I liked. Major Major's father had a good joke about opportunity. Opportunity only knocks once in this world, he would say. Major Major's father repeated this good joke at every opportunity. So for some reason, that catch-22 came into my head. You know, like a month ago, and I wrote down, you know, it's the only thing I could remember from catch-22. I mean, I remember the basic idea of catch-22. It's a, it's a book I'd actually like to reread because I remember really liking it as a kid. I think that possibly that and other things that have come into my mind lately have been 
pushing me back to this particular journal. So the following entry after that is marked October 9th. And this is me becoming fascinated about electrical outlets. So this is interesting because when I wrote that dream, you know, I wrote that thing about Major Major in my journal from a month ago. That was also around the time that I had the dream about the ant having cancer. And it's also the time that I dreamt about that tree burning up with the wind blowing from the right. So this to me is just more confirmation that PG&E is involved, deeply, deeply, deeply involved in mind control. And, in fact, I've been having these dreams about, um, and I didn't remember writing this in the journal, and I just found it, but I have been having these dreams about the scare faces in electrical outlets, specifically scare faces connected to electrical outlets, you know, and these big eyes staring, just waiting to get you, I write. Then I write, ever since my curling iron turned against me in 7th or 8th grade, before that even, electricity scares me. Now, what happened in 7th and 8th grade is I was very sloppy about how I plugged in things into electrical outlets, and I've actually seen that sort of emulated in um, the movie called Colossal. I saw something, the way I used to plug things in, I don't know why I was so sloppy, it could very well have been mind control. Like I was always wiggling and accidentally touching the metal right before it would go into the outlet. I've also seen it emulated in a video, I think a Romeo Voided video from the 80s, like the early 80s. Uh, if anybody remembers Romeo Void. So in this case, I actually gave myself a good shock because not only was I touching the metal of the um, plug as it went into the outlet, but I was holding onto a metal faucet with the other hand. So, um, so I was creating a complete circuit with a faucet. And I wrote, my teeth chattered and wiggled when it happened. So I, my whole body started to shake from the um, electrical current, and I fell down. I said I fell down or threw myself down or was knocked over. I have never figured out what exactly put me on the ground. So, um, and then I write, a friend of a friend's dog was wearing a metal leash and wound it around a radiator, and my friend's friend tried to unwind him, zap, he was gone. So I'm talking about somebody who was electrocuted, supposedly trying to unwind a metal leash from around a radiator. Then, the next paragraph, I've been wanting to get an electric guitar two days in a row. And yes, I was actually very concerned because I didn't really understand how electric guitars worked. And so I used to be worried about plugging in the, um the cord to the guitar thinking that it was like an electrical circuit or something like that and so there were things about the electrical guitar that I didn't understand was concerned about and I have a feeling some of this might have been on purpose to be honest I mean now that I've started to see the little time the few times that I've written down what I see in the news and how it relates to things that I do during the day you know I mean I now see that the news you know whoever is involved in um, journalism any type of journalism, has privy to um, my life, my private life in some way. So things get manipulated in weird ways through the media based on this um, very strange thing that's going on. And one of the ways things get manipulated is people, situations are manipulated. So people get bad press either because the press wants to give them bad press or because... They've been paid to give somebody bad press. Or a really good example, actually, is... It's kind of funny, but it's a really good example of this. A few days ago, or maybe a couple weeks ago, I did... I did a series of videos on um, mind-control-based pedestrian accidents where pedestrians get hit by cars. And I pointed out why... I could tell that these were mind control situations, that these were set up accidents. And then I saw something about the word pedestrian in the New York Times on the day an accident occurred right, you know, I shouldn't call them accidents because they're not, but this, this event occurred right in my neighborhood. I walked to the store, I saw 
the police line, walked into the store, and for some reason decided to buy a New York Times, walked out of the store, didn't read the New York Times until a week later, but it was on that same day and everything, and it's used, somebody used the word pedestrian in it. And there's that and other little things made me believe that the New York Times even knew something was going on with pedestrians. So I made a video about that. Well, as soon as I made a video about that, I started to see stuff in the New York Times that, you know, looked to me like it was scare tactics almost towards me. And not only that, but the New York Times changed their firewall so that I can't, like, sneak in by clearing my cache anymore, which was kind of cute. Uh, you know, normally you would not think that those things were linked. You wouldn't think that something that you had said about the New York Times, you know, in a YouTube video that got maybe a dozen views would be linked to the New York Times changing their behavior. But in fact, I do think that was the case. And I don't think it happens all the time. So in this case, I've been wanting to get an electric guitar. And all of a sudden I'm reading in the, you know, meanwhile, I'm reading in the San Francisco Chronicle, who we all know started the Bohemian Club. Um, stuff about uh, a man got shocked when a beer spilled on his amp. He leapt 30 feet holding his guitar and unplugged it. The audience loved it. He lived. Day two, a kid was playing his guitar and there was a short. I am deathly afraid of shorts, whatever they are. <laughs> so. In eighth grade, we were taught that it was electricity taking the wrong short way. He lived long enough to ask for a drink, then boom. So I'm reading two incidents in a row of somebody playing guitar and becoming electrocuted right when I'm thinking of getting an electric guitar. I read the San Francisco Chronicle every single morning, so that would have been a very good way to control the way I thought through the San Francisco Chronicle. You know, if you're that worried about me, and, you know, yes, people are that worried about me. And I read in the Kron when that guy, his first name was John, his last name something like Spinkelink, was, was electrocuted. So that was when I was 11 years old, and that stayed with me a very long time. There's a very, very, very graphic description of somebody being electrocuted in an electric chair. So then I write, I had this yucky feeling I always associated with electrocution. And so, yes, that's uh, that haunted me. Um, I hope I'm not stranded in a lightning storm in a field. I hope my guitar doesn't get me. The stranded in a lightning storm in a field, that's, that's like what happened in the dream I had about Brett on February 13th, 1988, four months before he was hit by a car on Highway 101 in Crescent City, California, which is where my daughter's father is from, but long before I met him. I hope my guitar doesn't get me. Electricity so neat, but you can't see it. You can only feel it running through every inch of your body, and you never know. Rubble, rubber souls could save you, rubber soul. So, this is all stream of consciousness writing, and... Um, these are real fears that I have, but it's this period of time, 83 and 84, I'm seeing a lot of foreshadowing about Brett. And this seems to be the period of time that whoever decided to um, attack Brett was actually, for some reason, and I guess it's just because of the occult nature of this, looking for hints about how to go about it, both in my journals and in my high school yearbook from 1984. Or maybe also they were looking for, I don't know, but um, when I say a lightning storm in a field, well, of course, on a, in a field, a field is a flat place where you can't get shelter because normally if you want to get away from lightning, the thing to do is to be in a place where if the lightning is going to hit, it's going to hit something like a lightning rod of some sort that's going to, you know, direct the current away from you, you know, and you don't want to be standing too close to that thing. But um, in a field, you know, you're going to be the tallest thing, and so you're more li likely to attract lightning. So, you know, and, and now I'm thinking this is this is intrusive in my head, so I'm going to mention it. Um, that Nirvana song called 
on a plane. Many, many of my dreams are about being in planes that never really go anywhere and it being a very terrifying experience usually. Um, but plane and plane is a, um, you know, a double meaning word and a plane is a flat place. So if you're on a plane in a lightning storm, you're in danger. You're in danger of being struck by lightning. And then again, lightning, something I had, I would have never imagined in my life that directed energy weapons existed back then, but lightning is code for directed energy weapons. It's a symbolic code for directed energy weapons. And the other thing I want to mention here, too, is um, I'm writing a lot about my childhood, my early childhood in these pages, and where I was born and all of that stuff. And I was born during a storm, and my daughter was born during a storm. And I think that these were generated storms. And when I went back to visit the place where I was born, San Juan Island, Friday Harbor, which is in Washington, but right up by the border. So, oh yes. So I was born by the borderline my, you know, of, of Canada. My grandmother was born by the borderline of Canada. And if you want to check that, my grandma was born in Two Harbors, Minnesota. And I was born in, and there's the twins again, Two Harbors. And I was born in Friday Harbor, Washington. My grandmother was in Two Harbors, Minnesota. I was in Friday Harbor, Washington. Both right on the borderline. Um, so when I went back to visit San Juan Island for the first time since I was a baby, it was in 1986 or 87. I think it was 19, it was 1986 or early 87. And my father took me up there and we went on a bike ride around the island. And as we were on this bike ride, this thunderstorm, thunder and lightning storm broke out out of nowhere. And it was terrifying to me. In fact, it was so close. The lightning was so close to the thunder that at one point I jumped off my bicycle and just jumped in a ditch. I mean, it was that scary. Um, there were other people on the tour. Other, nobody else was quite as scared as I was, but I was terrified. Um, it seemed like it was very close. And it didn't connect with me at the time for some reason, the fact that I was born up there because of a storm, because they couldn't fly into Seattle, so I was born on San Juan Island in Friday Harbor. But uh, it is interesting now. Now I think that, uh, now I think those matching storms are generated storms. They're generated by frequencies. And um, obviously they've had the ability to do this long before they had harp. I don't think harp, I don't remember when harp started, but you know, people say it's harp, but this, they had the ability to do this before harp. So, yes, I'm afraid of my guitar because of all these, you know, look at all these stories in the Chronicle, you know, right before I'm deciding to get an electric guitar. And I get shocked by my curling iron. That must have happened. And I was in junior high school when that happened, so it was probably around 81. So then I say things like, I hope electric guitars don't become a reality. Not understanding that electric cars probably won't electrocute you. I hope I'm not stranded in a lightning storm in a field. I hope my guitar doesn't get me. This is the last thing I write, and I think you always have to keep in mind the consideration that my writing, especially the stream of consciousness writing, is directly being influenced by mind control because I was, I know that I had thought in, thoughts being sent to me as early as grade school. So this is, you know, high school. Um... I write that it can't be completely controlled and it is so excitable it wants to go, go, go. That's what it is waiting for in those little holes, seemingly empty, deep, dark sockets. I'm ending now. Bye, bye, bye. So, like I said, me looking at this now, I think this is done under the influence of mind control. Next we have October 24th or something. Paula and I went to the Grateful Dead movie on October 7th. We danced with the Deadheads to Sugar Magnolia. I bought a dead record, American Beauty. I wore my Hard Day's Night t-shirt. Okay, so I'm meeting uh, other girls that like the Beatles. Everything is about the Beatles in this book. <clears throat> oh, 
Paula is written with a curly Q. Um, this would have been the second time I saw the Grateful Dead movie because Michelle, my friend Michelle's parents took us to the Grateful Dead movie like probably when it came out in the late 70s. I'm pretty certain, which is just kind of funny in retrospect that um, you would take a fourth grader to the Grateful Dead movie. So this is just to note that um, I got an electric guitar This would have been November of 1983. All right. Yeah, it was right before Thanksgiving, 1983. So, um, for some reason I got really obsessive about the I Ching, and that goes on my whole life, and it looks like it started in 1983, too. That was kind of interesting. That and writing my dreams. Guitar, I Ching, and writing my dreams. All seem to start right around 1983. I think I wrote my dreams a little bit earlier as well, but um, I started to write them more and more over the 80s. I'm going to mention this one as well. December 29th. Um, Brooks was the person who ran Wildwood Music in Arcata, Brooks Otis. Um, Don's Donut Bar, probably still there to this day. Um, Chinese Restaurant, Bob Morley's Greatest Hits. But this is what I wanted to m mention, The Who, Tommy used 99 cents. The hippie at the counter regarded me with a suspicious eye when I brought it to the counter and said, that's a really good price for Tommy, isn't it? He looked at me like he expected me to answer, and I looked at him, yes. He then proceeded to check one of the records, which weren't bad, and gave in. No, I didn't switch tags, bought a Beatle postcard. Maybe this was genuinely, he actually thought that I was going to try to, you know, switch tags on Tommy. Um, but it's interesting in retrospect because of the connections with the who, and because there's certain people who have come into my life that have tw what I, you know, twins. And one of them is a person named Tom, Tom, had, there were twin Toms in my life and there were twins, not just in their names, but in certain other things about them. So that's just, I'm just going to mention that Tommy.